I don't see the big word. Okay. Make sure to flip to the next screen. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome for those of you who are in person and those who are online. We are so delighted that you are here with us at our um, at our January lecture today. I am Robin Axel Adam, the, the manager of the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics. Um, a few things that we wanna highlight for you that are up here on the screen um, before we get going. Uh, registration is now open for our um, ethics conference, um, and it's going to be held in person only on Friday, February 3rd at Hine Hall at IUPUI. Um, there is that amazing QR code down there, so if you would like to scan that, uh, then it'll pop up that will give you the link to the conference program and the registration link. Um, and that reg and the registration link will also be sent out in the evaluations tomorrow, so Annie has got all of that covered. Thank you, Annie. Um, and then please use the text code. Um, for those of you who are uh, needing your CME and CE, please use that code in order to get credit for that. This um, certificates will be sent out approximately in 30 days um, after this lecture. So um, please go ahead and, and take a minute to do that. And also just to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and available on our website, fairbankcenter.org within the next week. So give us a week. Uh, and we encourage you to send this to your colleagues that so they are able to watch as well. Um, for those watching via Zoom, the Q&A box is available to post questions. However, we will not be responding to most questions until the end of the presentation. And then um, just one more thing to highlight here that I wanted to make sure we paid attention to is that um, if you're interested in our fellowship, you're curious about our ethics fellowship, we invite you to attend our um, our lunch and learn on February 13th and February 16th. You can either attend virtually or in person, but we'd like you to also register for that. So use that amazing QR code there. All right. So um, it is my exciting pleasure to introduce Dr. Doyle. Dr. Doyle has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and it's fun for me to say Dr. Doyle because when I worked with Tom earlier, um, Tom was, was still in his PhD process. And so to Dr. Tom Doyle completed his PhD in philosophy at Purdue University in May of 2022. So a very recent grad and go boiler up. And he started a postdoctoral fellowship at the IU Center for Bioethics in June of then 2022. He completed our fellowship here um, with the class of 1920, or 2020, sorry, not 1920. Woo! That completed with the class of 2020. Um, Dr. Doyle's dissertation research focused on illness experience and how the notion of personalized medicine can be expanded to also include um, patients' personal experiences of their own illness. The inspiration for Dr. Doyle's research is often drawn from his own experience as a patient for he is a survivor of Hodgkin's lymphoma for which he was diagnosed during his second year of graduate studies. As a junior researcher, he is still developing his area of research interest, but is currently working on multiple qualitative based research projects focused on patients understanding and patients perspective of their healthcare. He was talking to me about it as we were walking down and using such big words that I was terrified that he had put that in his introduction and he did not. So his research is on amazing things that are really long and complicated to say, and I know he will love to talk to you about it. But outside of his research, Dr. Jo Doyle enjoys writing poetry, painting with acrylics, and trying to keep up with that never ending reading list. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Tom. Hi everyone, I am not Dr. Tom Doyle. I wanted to make a quick announcement. I know that there is an issue with the CME text code right now and I greatly apologize for that. We will work on, a situ on the situation for that as of right now. We have your names recorded because of the way that you are logged into Zoom. So we will make sure that CME has the email addresses for the people who have attended. Thanks. And I am Dr. Tom Doyle, I think. Um, I'm able, unable to press this X. <laughs> Technical difficulties to begin. Wrong mouse. Thank you. It tricked you. Okay. So thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here, both in person and online. Um, it's always dangerous to invite a philosopher to talk uh, because 
one, we like to talk, and two, uh, we like to use a lot of terminology. Um, so this, this talk might be a, a bit heady, um, and there's a lot of moving parts, but I think those moving parts are not like an avalanche falling downhill, but more of like a train slowly moving on, graduate of Purdue, so think of that train slowly moving on. So if you're ever getting lost, uh, just know that basically what you need to understand is epistemic means knowledge, and when I use the term hermeneutics, I just mean understanding. Now for you, thankfully, when I uh, first heard my first philosophy talk that was ever given to me, it was a professor that I pretty well respected. It's my sophomore year. And I remember we we're all in this conference room sitting, listening to this talk. And the first thing that he does is he, he brings out his, his manuscript and he just starts reading it in front of everybody. And that's literally all the talk was, was him reading the manuscript. And I thought, wow, what an awful way to present an idea. So thankfully, you know, you have a philosopher, but thankfully I'm not reading a manuscript to you. I'm reading a talk. So let's get into it. Um, so my talk today is entitled Patient Voices and Clinicians Concerns, uh, Epistemic Injustice in Healthcare. Um, a brief presentation outline. So first, I'm going to define the term epistemic injustice because I have a feeling that not a lot of people know what epistemic injustice is. I'm going to break it down into its two constitutive components, which is testimonial injustice and hermeneutical interpretive injustice. And then I'm going to illustrate how epistemic injustice impacts healthcare clinical practice by examining power dynamics in medicine and giving some clinical examples. And then finally, identify some strategies to mitigate the harms associated with epistemic injustice. So to begin with, what is this term? How, do we, how are we going to understand epistemic injustice? So on one side, we have the term epistemic, which relates to knowledge, relates to knowing something. And so when we're talking about epistemology or epistemic things, we're talking about sets of information. So we can think of this from the clinical realm as you know, lab results or a CT scan or something like that. That's a set of information. That's a set of things that you know um, that's presented to you. We can think of the epistemic relationships. Um, so when we transfer our knowledge, we engage in an epistemic relationship. We transfer one thing to another person and that, thing, and that person hopefully transfers something back to us. And then we can also talk about education. So our knowledge, for the most part, is not immediate. It requires some interpretation, some digestion. And the way that we get a uh, framework for how to interpret or digest these sets of information is through education. So that's kind of a brief rundown of what we mean by the term epistemic. So it's no longer scary for you. It's knowledge. And then injustice, on the other hand, um, we're probably more familiar with that term. Uh, but as far as I'm using it, I'm using it in uh, as far as we're talking about what someone deserves. So when we're talking about injustice, we're talking about what someone deserves or what someone is owed. And we can talk about uh, injustice in as far as the distributions of goods. So we can talk about the distribution of wealth and the unjust distribution of wealth or, or something of that sort. I would talk about punishments and rewards being unjust or unjust. Um, so someone's the punishment doesn't fit the crime or the reward doesn't, doesn't fit the accolade. Um, we can also talk about social hierarchy. So our society is not flattened where everyone kind of holds the same social position. We have social hierarchies and we can talk about whether or not those hierarchies are justified. Does it make sense that someone with, you know, let's say advanced degrees is given higher acclaim than someone with lower degrees, things like that. And so when we put these two terms together, we get as Miranda Fricker, who is the, uh, progenitor of epistemic, of, not of epistemic injustice, but of the book Epistemic Injustice. Um, and she defines epistemic injustice as a wrong done to someone specifically in their capacity as a knower. What does that mean? Um, in simpler terms, it's basically not considering someone capable of possessing, transferring, or interpreting knowledge based on unwarranted or harmful prejudice. And so the injustice portion of this fits in it's not as if you're discrediting somebody because you have a reason to discredit them or even a reason not to believe them, but rather you disbelieve them because of some social thing, some, something irrelevant to what they're actually um, trying to tell you or the knowledge they're trying to present to you. Now, a key concept in this concept of epistemic injustice is knowledge communities. So we might think that knowledge transfer works kind of like a game of telephone. So you have person A who possesses knowledge X, let's say, and then they 
try to demonstrate or transfer this knowledge. And then person B is listening to person A and they get that knowledge. And then person B transfer that to another person. And then all of a sudden you have a knowledge community. You have a group of people who know something about something and it, it kind of works uh, streamlined that, you know, there's no, there's no problems, right? The knowledge gets transferred across persons to persons to persons. And all of a sudden you have a knowledge community, people who know things. But as the game of telephone shows us, knowledge transfer actually doesn't work in that way. So how does it work actually in our social reality? Well, we can look at person A here who has a social trait. So they have greenness, let's say, and they attempt to transfer knowledge to person B. Person B decides, ah, oh, this person has greenness. I'm not going to accept their testimony. There's no other credible reason for why that person should reject their testimony other than the fact that they possess greenness. So that's one way that knowledge transfer can actually go wrong in our social reality. And then we can also have, you know, person A tries to transfer knowledge to a group of persons, tries to talk to a group of persons and say, believe me about this. And they say, no, I'm not going to trust that person. They have, they, they have greenness. Their, their testimony can't be trusted. And so all this is just to say that uh, knowledge is not immune uh, to social forces that can accelerate or hinder its transfer. Um, social and power dynamics uh, play into the transferring of knowledge and the creation of knowledge communities. And these social and power dynamics can harm knowers as the importance of their knowledge is not taken seriously, or they are provided with the inappropriate tools to understand their knowledge. Now, another key concept um, to epistemic injustice is um, that's two kind of subcomponents. So we have on one side testimonial injustice. And then on the other side, hermeneutical interpretive injustice. And in testimonial injustice, we can just break down testimony into the transferring of knowledge. So whenever you're telling someone, whenever you're trying to transfer knowledge to another person, whenever you're trying to communicate knowledge to another person, that's just testimony. And now the weight of your testimony, as far as testimonial injustice is concerned, is socially defined. So ultimately what that can result in as far as injustice goes is credibility deficit. So a person's testimony is discredited because they possess a particular social trait. So let's say we have this person who has redness in this example, and they're trying to give knowledge to a person who has blueness. So basically they're trying to provide testimony for this blue person saying, believe me. And the blue person says, no, you have redness. I'm not going to believe you. So that's called the credit that's defined as a credibility deficit here. But we can also have testimonial injustice in which a person's testimony is discredited because they lack proper social standing. So we have this person who has blueness and is also, you know, fairly highly acclaimed. They have a prize there, you know, maybe numerous degrees or something like that. And person, uh, this, this person with the redness tries to say, you know, believe me about this blue person. And the blue person says, no, I'm not going to believe you about this. You don't have the right social standing. And so that would be an example of testimonial injustice. And then on the other hand, we have hermeneutical injustice. Um, and the kind of basis behind why we even talk about hermeneutical injustice or interpretive injustice is because knowledge is not immediate. It requires interpretation. So we can think of this from an easy clinical example of CT scans. CT scans, you look at the bottom of the CT scan, the radiologist provides the impressions and that provides the interpretation, the clinical interpretation of what the doctor, doctor is supposed to get away from that CT scan. So knowledge is not immediate. It requires, you know, interpretations, either interpretive frameworks or the interpretation of others in order to make it make sense. And social and power dynamics have the ability to uh, prevent certain inter interpretations or enforce other interpretations. So uh, we can think of censorship as an example of hermeneutical injustice. So we have here uh, the red book and the blue book. Um, the blue book is censored, let's say, by some force. Someone doesn't want the, the interpretive framework from the blue book to be passed on. So they burn the blue book or they reject or they censor the blue book in some way. And then you have a knowledge community which forms that only has the red interpretation. That's the only accepted way to view reality then is this, is this red way of viewing reality. And in another way, you can have um, censorship kind of of persons or of knowers. So you can have, you know, a kind of diverse community of, of blue and red. And for whatever way possible, they, there is some elimination of the Reds groups knowing or knowledge or, you know, say, don't believe the Red people or something like that. And then you result in a community of knowers that only has the blue framework to kind of go by. So those are the two constitutive components of 
what counts as epistemic injustice. And we can see here a taxonomy of epistemic injustice of what we've gone through so far. Um, this taxonomy is not complete. Uh, epistemic injustice is a fairly new uh, field of uh, philosophical inquiry. You know, 2007 was when the idea really came to mind. Um, and so the taxonomy is ever growing. So what you see here is just the basic sampling of it. Um, you can go out into the wide world of philosophy and find numerous different uh, branches that you can add onto it. But this is for our purposes, this is where we're at now. So that's the brief philosophy stuff. That's all past us. <laughs> we can now move on to why we're all here, which is uh, how does epistemic injustice relate to healthcare? Why do we talk about epistemic injustice in, in, in the context of healthcare? Well, first we can think of knowledge communities in healthcare. So this is a kind of you know, quaint example of what a knowledge community might look like in healthcare. We have patients, clinicians, and administrators. These are just the ones that came to the top of my head. This is not an exhaustive example of knowledge communities in healthcare. Um, and so we see patients, what they do is they provide their testimony of their symptoms to clinicians and clinicians are supposed to provide diagnosis or treatment to patients. You have clinicians who uh, report to hospital administrators. Um, you have administrators that provide policy to uh, clinicians. Um, you have patients who provide their opinions and values to administrators, and then you have administrators providing policy to patients or just letting them know what's generally going on at the hospital or things that they should be aware of. Um, so that's kind of a, again, quaint picture of what uh, knowledge communities, but I wanna make it even smaller by focusing specifically today on the relationship between clinicians and patients and how epistemic injustice might impact the relationship between clinicians and patients. And to do that, we first have to look at the power dynamics that are at play in the patient-doctor relationship. So we can start by thinking about what do patients know? Well, they have knowledge of their values, of their symptoms, of their experiences, of their preferences. Patients possess all these things. They're experts in their own first personal experience, one might say. Physicians, on the other hand, I mean, as well, they have their values and experiences and preferences, but in addition to all of that, they also have their medical expertise, uh, they know about treatment options, they can offer clinical recommendations. And so from this knowledge comes different powers that can be expressed by both clinicians and patients. So patients have the power to pursue legal action if there's malpractice or harms done to them that's available to them. They have the right to refuse treatment based on their preferences. They can say, I don't want, I don't want this uh, done to me. Um, they can express their values, preferences, and experiences. And doctors or physicians, on the other hand, they have the power to diagnose, they have the power to explain conditions, they have the power to treat, recommend, refer, provide guidance to, or advocate for. So in the kind of ideal world, this may be how things work of, of kind of a reciprocal one-to-one -one relationship where patients provide their values, preferences, and experiences, and, patient, and doctors provide immediately the diagnosis and the treatment recommendations and they guide and advocate for. We know that's not how it actually works in practice because things get in the way uh, of, these, of this relationship and of this transfer of knowledge and power. And the reason, one of the main reasons why uh, things get in the way is prejudice that persists within healthcare. Um, so we can look at this through the racial and gender disparities in healthcare. I have some examples from the literature so this is a biomedical uh, central medical ethics journal, uh, uh, just a systematic review of 42 articles on implicit bias and implicit bias is not the overt bias that you may harbor towards somebody. Like it's not as if you know, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna discredit this person because they possess this social trait. It's more of an unconscious uh, kind of insidious type of bias that you harbor against somebody and you may not even know that you, that you do that. And what they found from the, from the 42 articles that they reviewed was the evidence indicates that healthcare professionals exhibit the same levels of implicit bias as the wider population. So putting on the white coat doesn't remove your implicit bias. Your clinicians are likely to harbor implicit bias just as much as anybody else in the general population is. And then we can look at how uh, race impacts uh, or can prejudice uh, the clinician-patient relationship. So this is a systematic review of 37 articles in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, and it found that over two-thirds of studies included in this review found evidence of racism among healthcare providers, 
just as astonishing. Uh, and this includes racist beliefs, emotions, and uh, behaviors and practices relating to minority patients. So there's prejudice against race that persists in healthcare, as far as the literature shows. And then there's also prejudice against gender. So this is a book by uh, Mayor uh, Maya uh, Dunsbury. Um, on my, on my long reading list, uh, but if you all had the opportunity, I would suggest it. Um, and it's called Doing Harm, uh, The Truth, How Bad Medicine and Lazy Science Leave Women mis Dismissed, Misdiagnosed, and Sick. And in the introduction, she writes, the average doctor does not know as much about women's body and the health problems that afflict them. It starts at the most basic level of biomedical research, where investigators overwhelmingly use male cells and animals in preclinical trials. And it continues throughout the clinical research process where women remain underrepresented, analysis by gender is rare, and women differing, differing, women's differing hormonal states and cycles usually go entirely unignored. Um, that's just a brief snippet of, of what she presents. It's a very well-researched book from what I can tell. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, again, I highly recommend that book to you. So how does epistemic injustice fit in? So I've given you all the kind of constituent opponents for what I think are the ingredients, let's say, of epistemic injustice. Um, and I think the two kind of categories that epistemic injustice uh, kind of is most easy to wrap your head around within medicine is treatment and diagnosis. So I'm gonna go further into kind of the, um, the ingredients, let's say, of epistemic injustice and treatment. So you have the first ingredient or the first kind of factor that factors into epistemic injustice as far as treatment goes is medical gaslighting. And so medical gaslighting refers to clinicians who refuse to accept their patient's interpretation of their symptoms. It's basically saying, no, you're not experiencing that. You don't, particularly in the example of pain, you don't feel that much pain. You're not in that much pain. You're saying it's a 10, it's not a 10, it's something else. That would be medical gaslighting. And then you also have social prejudice, which we just went over. Um, clinicians refuse to consider a patient's interpretations of their symptoms because they possess a certain social trait. And when those two uh, meet together, you have what I'm calling interpretive dismissal, which is basically saying the patients don't have an accurate grasp of their experience. They're saying their pain's a 10, no. They're saying they have that symptom, no, they don't have that symptom. That's kind of what interpretive dismissal looks like. And what this results in is, of course, under treatment. You can't treat somebody if you don't believe they have a condition that they say that they have. Um, disease progression, again, if you're not treating somebody for a disease that progresses, it's going to progress and also they have that treatment. And this leads, both of these lead to poor outcomes for patients. So to kind of fill this in a bit more as far as how this, how epistemic injustice works with respect to treatment, um, we can examine the kind of the knowledge community that uh, operates between clinicians, physicians, and patients uh, with regards to treatment. So we have uh, patients who are, this is kind of the telephone ideal worldview of how things go. Uh, patients provide their symptoms to clinicians and clinicians provide treatment or referral for, for that, for those set of symptoms, kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, nothing's going wrong. But we can see how things can go wrong if we factor in epistemic injustice and we can look at, you know, Patients who are trying to provide their symptoms, uh, there's a prejudice due to social traits, and so their symptoms don't get heard by their clinicians. The clinician says, no, I don't believe that you have this going on because of some social trait that you have. <clears throat> but you also have then the treatment and referral process falls apart because there's a rejection of the patient's interpretation of the symptoms. You don't have what's going on. You don't have what you say you have, so I'm not going to treat you for that. I'm not going to treat you for your pain or for the symptom that you're saying that you're having. And now, as far as how prejudice factors into this, I want to point your attention to a quite interesting study uh, done by Hoffman and colleagues at the University of Virginia. I think this was University of Virginia medical students, uh, not to throw that institution on the bus. It's a fantastic medical school, of course. Um, but they, they did this study where they looked at two study populations. So the first study they, done, they did uh, was just an online sample of, I think, just general population that they pulled. And it and the study, I, to give you more context to it, it's about false beliefs about the differences in biology between white patients and black patients. And um, so they did this first study, and we can see study one here, um, you know, pretty high, <laughs> astonishingly high. Um, 
examples of kind of racial racial prejudice and on harboring false beliefs about uh, about black patients. And then we can see on the second study that they, that they did, they conducted it on med students, first years, second years, third years, and even residents. And um, all of this was in the context about whether or not this would affect uh, patient or perfect, um, affect providers' perceptions of black patients' pain and whether or not they should treat that pain. And we can see kind of two uh, kind of key characteristics uh, for why, you know, patients or why providers who harbor these false beliefs might not want to treat patients for pain. You have black skin is thicker than whites. You have 25% of the residents there supporting that uh, belief. Uh, blacks have denser, stronger bones than whites. You have 29% of the residents still believe in that. So they've gone through their medical education. They have their degree and they still are harboring these false beliefs. And the study found that white medical students and residents who endorsed false beliefs showed racial bias in the accuracy of their pain treatment recommendations. Specifically, participants who endorsed more of these beliefs reported that a black versus white patient, target patient, would feel less pain and they were less accurate in their treatment recommendations for the black versus white patient, although the effects of these findings were not large given that. Um, the practical importance is significant though. Those endorsing more false beliefs rated the pain of black versus white patients half a scale point lower than and were less accurate in the treatment recommendations 15% of the time. So what this essentially amounts to is basically saying that black patients don't feel pain the same way that white patients do. They're saying you're wrong in interpreting your pain just on the basis of the color of your skin. And unfortunately, um, there is more literature to back this up for uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color patients and, and, and their perceptions of pain. So a 2019 retrospective cohort study, which examined racial disparities in the management of postpartum pain in 9,900 women, found that non-Hispanic women were less likely to report a pain score of 5 of 10 at discharge, so they had their pain better treated or they didn't have that much pain to begin with. Um, but they were more likely to receive opioids for the treatment of inpatient acute pain than Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black patients. So basically what's happening there is Black patients are leaving the hospital with more pain um, than, than white patients. Um, and they're not getting their pain, they weren't be, be having their pain treated within the uh, acute postpartum uh, setting. So again, another misinterpretation of basically saying patients are not feeling that pain, so I'm not gonna treat them for that pain. And then we have another, uh, this is a systematic review uh, following the PRISMA guidelines, so well, well done uh, review of 763 articles, an enormous amount of articles, examining racial disparities in the treatment of acute pain in the emergency department setting. And it found that both black patients, again, the odds ratio isn't huge, but pretty not pretty big, um, that both black and Hispanic patients were less likely to receive analgesia for pain than white patients. So again, as far as these 730 uh, articles are concerned that there is this example of uh, basically telling patients that they're not experiencing that pain. They have a wrong interpretation of, of what they're experiencing. And to move on to the other side of, uh, prejudice is women's health. So we can think of the cases of hysteria and women's health. So uh, the term hysteria originally comes from the Greek term for womb or uterus. Um, and it stems from the ancient Greek belief that all women's health concerns stem from uh, the womb or stems from the uterus. Um, historically, it was used as a catch-all diagnosis for any health complaints that come from a woman. So if the woman complains about anything, um, the doctor might say, yeah, you have hysteria. That's what's the problem. And this is a false misattribution. So basically it's an interpret, it's telling women to interpret their symptoms, not as actually a physiological or a problem with themselves, but it's a psychological or a hormonal problem that's going on with them. And we can see this again in the literature. So this was a study that examined the disparities in patients' interpretations of heart disease symptoms uh, by patient gender. So they did video vignettes and presented them to uh, physicians and asked them to, what do you think is going on here um, with, with, in this video vignette? And they did it with males and females roughly at the age of like 55. The, the patients were supposed to look, I think, you know, we're supposed to be around 55. And the important thing to note here is that mental health 
So a, a woman could have heart disease, or they did have heart disease in this video of any other. They're supposed to have the symptoms of heart disease, but 31% um, of the females, uh, or 31% of the doctors said that the female patients were having mental health issues as opposed to an actual heart issue. And that's the only statistical significant piece where there is, is having that distinction between males, you know, 15% of the time, females, 31% of the time. So hysteria, unfortunately, I think is still persistent within medicine or the idea of hysteria is still persistent within medicine. And this continues, I think, even in today. Um, this was a review article of uh, how gender bias can impact uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes. Um, and it causes, essentially what's going on here is of course the doctor saying uh, with women with, um, coming in with you know, maybe acute or chronic uh, cardiovascular issues, they may say, no, you're not having those symptoms. You're misinterpreting what's going on with you. You have psychological symptoms that is, that is leading you. So it's, a mis it's basically telling their patients you're misinterpreting what's going on with you. And so what you have is uh, there have a likelihood to underestimate the risk of heart disease. Um, this may lead to women not seeking out investigations for symptoms, uh, which of course reduces uh, good outcomes for, for these women who are in, have, have heart disease. And also we have time to diagnosis. Um, so there is a longer uh, lag time between, between a woman who shows up with cardiovascular uh, symptoms and their diagnosis of a cardiovascular condition. There's a longer time for them. And we know um, the longer time you wait on treating cardiovascular conditions, the worse off you are. Um, which leads me to kind of the next, as far as diagnosis goes, the next kind of area in which case, in which I think epistemic justice shows up in medicine, and that is diagnosis. So these are kind of the ingredients or the factors that play into uh, diagnosis and epistemic injustice in healthcare. We have the concept of disease prestige, which I think probably is a new concept to most of you all. Uh, but basically it's the idea that clinicians are more or less likely to deem a disease real or worthy of their sympathy, concern, or consideration. Um, so not all diseases are created equal, let's just say. Um, and often there's a lack for people who think about disease prestige, they may think that there's a, if there's a lack of a gold standard sensitive and specific diagnostic test, they might count that as, that's a lower disease prestige. I don't have a single test that can diagnose it, so it's not worth my time trying to investigate it further. Um, and then also we have social prejudice, which of course is sticking around here, um, and basically it accounts to rejecting patients' testimony, so they're telling their doctor, their symptoms, and um, there is a prejudice that stops them from accepting the, the, the reporting of those symptoms. So there's a credibility deficit, which we talked about earlier, that's occurring as far as diagnosis and epistemic injustice goes. And so what's the result of this? You have misdiagnosis, you have diagnostic odysseys, which basically means that patients go on these long gauntlets of, of testing to try to figure out what is explaining their symptoms, which is expensive for both the hospital and also the patient. And then you also have poor outcomes because if you don't have a diagnosis, you can't treat that diagnosis. And um, of course, it's gonna result in worse outcomes for patients. So a case of this happens in the hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome community, uh, the HEDS community. Um, it's diagnosed um, using a diagnostic criteria. There's no one gold standard sensitive and specific test that says definitively this is hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos. Rather, there's a, a set of robust diagnostic criteria that people use. Um, the most kind of well-known is the Byton scoring system, which measures the flexibility of joints. Um, but in, in addition to that, there is also uh, the self-reporting aspect of, of, of HEDS. So there is uh, one of the diagnostic criteria is the perceptions of pain. And so pain is, is an inherently subjective experience, which needs to be listened to based on a testimony that is given. You can't look at a patient and you know, derive, are they in pain or not? I mean, in some cases you can, but you don't know, you know what the extent of that pain is. Um, and so there's a, uh, a self-reporting uh, aspect that also plays in to the diagnostic criteria for HEDS. 
And so what might the knowledge community look like for HEDS? Well, you have the telephone version, the ideal version, where the patient reports their symptoms, um, having all of these symptoms, and the clinician applies the diagnostic criteria to the patient and says, yes, you have HEDS. Now, in the, in the real world uh, view of things, we have the problem against prejudice against uh, uh, women in healthcare. So approximately 70% of the HEDS patients are female. So you have the problem of gender bias within medicine or gender prejudice within medicine. And then you also have a low disease prestige um, due to some clinicians referring to uh, the diagnosis of HEDS as a soft diagnosis, meaning that because it requires some self-reporting on the patients, uh, on behalf of the patients, that it's not as good as a disease, where it's, in which case I can do a one-to-one -one test that tells me, yes, you definitely have this disease because you have this biomarker or something of that sort. And so there is a difference. Um, so, and just, so that's just to say that the diagnostic criteria isn't going to be supplied because clinicians may not be even worthy, may not even think of HEDS as something worthy of even being diagnosed or looking into. And we can look at the examples of how this epistemic injustice um, results in, in poor outcomes for HEDS patients. So this is this, um, this first study is a 2019 survey of uh, 12,000 patients in Europe with rare diseases. Um, and it, spoke, it focused on EDS. Um, HEDS is the largest subtype of, or yeah, HEDS is the largest subtype of EDS with I think 90%. Um, but it found of EDS patients that a period of 14 years elapsed between the first clinical manifestation, so the first time they went, or they first experienced their symptoms and uh, of their disease and diagnosis for patients. And before obtaining the correct EDS diagnosis, a misdiagnosis was given to 56% of patients, and this included a psychiatric, again, hysteria, um, in 20% of these patients. And also um, another study uh, done by uh, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Colin Halverson, and also Claire Francomano, who is also a clinician here at IU Health. Um, this was a examining the diagnostic odysseys of patients with HEDS and uh, Halverson and colleagues write, clinicians regularly doubted the reality of the symptoms driving participants complaint. Complaints. In fact, all participants shared at least one unprompted story of a clinician who treated them as a bad historian. I would have a symptom of a UTI, one woman told us, but they weren't showing up in the clinician's analysis. So they were saying that I didn't have them, <clears throat> but I was in severe pain. I feel like they didn't trust me. One woman's symptoms were dismissed, and she was given a diagnosis of somatization disorder, which caused her neurologist to stop seeing her. Another woman said that I can see that another woman who, who, who the doubt of her clinicians drove her into a deep depression, leading her to worry about others in similar situations. She said, I can see that doubt causing somebody to spiral downwards and decide, this doctor thinks I'm making it all up. I'm just going to kill myself now. The woman of a child with HEDS even told a story about how the Department of Social Services was called on her uh, because of the clinician's concerns about Munchausen syndrome. So we can see examples of um, epistemic injustice that show up within the HEDS patient population. And the second case I want to discuss is uh, lupus, or there's multiple subtypes of lupus, but I'm referring to the most common subtype here, which is uh, systematic lupus uh, erythematosus, or SLE. Um, it's, it's diagnosed using a set of diagnostic criteria. I have some of the criteria right there. Um, but it's, uh, it, you can see it's four of the 11. So there's multiple tests that need to be done. There's no one single gold standard sensitive and specific test for lupus. Um, and the most common uh, maybe telltale sign of lupus is, a, is the rash um, that this portrait is portraying with a, the it's called Myler rash. Um, so we can think about how the knowledge community works in lupus. So you have, again, the patient reporting of their symptoms to their clinician, the clinician saying, you may have lupus, let me investigate that. And then applying the diagnostic criteria to patients and saying, yes, you have lupus. 
how does that work in the real world? You have low disease prestige of lupus because again, of a soft diagnosis, you need four out of the, the 11 in, in one case, I think four out of 13 in another. So it requires multiple clinical investigation. It requires more testing to be done, more of a um, kind of buy-in from the clinician. And so in some cases it might result in lower disease prestige. It's a soft diagnosis. It, it may not have, there's no one sensitive or specific test. And so clinicians may feel that they're not gonna investigate it more. But then we also have uh, a kind of double bind for, for patients with lupus because 90% uh, of them are women. And it's also a disease that affects predominantly black populations, I think 2.5 to 3.5 fold increase uh, for black patients to, or for black women to develop lupus as opposed to white women. And on this, this epistemic injustice results in poor outcomes for lupus patients. We have uh, a quite recent book by Eleanor uh, Cleghorn, which uh, again, another book recommendation to, to give you all. It's uh, Unwell Woman, a Misdiagnosis and Myth in a Man's Made World. Um, she, she went through, uh, she, she was inspired to write this book from her own journey, uh, trying to get a diagnosis for her lupus. And I think it was like 10 years before she was diagnosed. Um, and then we can also turn to this cross-sectional survey um, this was 320 or 3,022 adults who suffered a self-reported diagnosis of lupus. And so their provider response to them pre-diagnosis, so pre-receiving their diagnosis, we can look here, 30% uh, of the time they got nothing was wrong. And 23% of the time it's psychological, which again, in comparison, um, is, is not terrible, but still pretty bad, but 30 and 23% of the time. And then as far as time to diagnosis, we can see here the effects. One to two years to be treated to diagnosis or to be given a diagnosis uh, for 15% of the population and then three plus years for 23% of the population. So an enormous amount of patients. And I have a story to share uh, for, from, the, from, from the BBC um, from this article. Um, it's about this woman named Jackie. Uh, so Jackie's experience is typical. She first felt ill at age 16 and for, her, for years she suffered from chronic kidney problems, uh, fevers, fatigue, and terrible uh, menstruation and joint pain. She saw a primary care doctor, a urologist, and a pulmonologist. Everyone was telling me there was nothing wrong with me, she says. After a few years, Jackie finally got one correct diagnosis. A friend, a well-off white woman, urged Jackie to go see a doctor in a wealthy suburb. He quickly diagnosed her with endometriosis and surgery alleviated much of her pelvic pain. But other problems persisted and eventually got worse. After moving to a new city for graduate school, it took another few years to find a set of doctors that would take her ser symptoms seriously. I had a lot of, you're just hysterical, she remembers. One of the more common things, especially in emergency rooms, was you're just drug seeking. As a woman of color, Jackie was facing more than just gender bias. Implicit biases on the basis of race, class, weight, sexual orientation, and trans status all affect uh, clinical care as well. Midway through her graduate school career, Jackie finally caught a break. She had been sick for months with a fever that doctors, despite soaking her in antibiotics, could not break. A primary care doctor, a woman of color, believe me, and she collected all of my medical records and literally took them home with her and started trying to piece the puzzle, piece everything together like it was a puzzle. She suspected that Jackie might have lupus and conducted the re relevant testing and then promptly diagnosed her with disease. It took her 10 years to get a diagnosis for her lupus. So again, we can see an example, an unfortunate example of epistemic injustice as it shows up in, in the healthcare setting. So the key points as far as epistemic injustice in healthcare goes, uh, epistemic injustice incurs in the patient-doctor relationship when the knowledge transfer process is distorted or disrupted due to a social prejudice. Uh, patients with so-called soft diagnosis that depend upon patient self-reporting are susceptible to credibility deficits, which result in epistemic injustice. And patients from marginalized, group often, uh, marginalized groups often have their symptoms misinterpreted or disregarded. So I thoroughly bummed you out <laughs> um, with everything that I've gone over. Um, so now what do we do about all of this stuff? What do we do about how to uh, mitigate epistemic injustice in healthcare? Um, and again, this is just beginning to be noticed as an issue. So 
the solutions are still being developed and some of the solutions actually map on to other solutions. So it's not to say that um, we don't have some script of how to deal with epistemic injustice in healthcare. And while I wanna to get to questions, I'm gonna kind of go over quickly some of the processes that we can engage in to prevent epistemic injustice in healthcare. The first one is just reducing your implicit bias. So implicit bias, again, is not this overt bias that one might hold. It's, it's not, you know, at, um, consciously thinking, I don't, I'm not going to believe this person because they have trait X. It's, you know, unconsciously, I don't believe this person because they have trait X, something that you're not intentioned to, to, to do. And so one way to kind of reduce implicit bias is making a well attempt to engage in diversity and cultural humility training, um, testing yourself for uh, unconscious bias using the implicit association test, which I have in a, a QR code right there. Um, and then developing plans to address or mitigate um, implicit biases. And I have some also shout outs to some other FCME grand rounds uh, that were conducted in last year and then last spring. So view those at your own, at your own leisure. Um, as far as what the literature shows, there's, I looked around, there's been only kind of one article talking about how to address this in the healthcare setting. Um, and these are a set of questions um, that clinicians may ask themselves or that patients may ask themselves in order to address epistemic injustice in healthcare. So uh, just to give a sampling here, clinicians, questions for clinicians to ask patients. What would you like to know? What would you like me to know about you? How would you describe your identity? What would you have wanted your clinicians to do better in the past? How can I demonstrate to you that I value and respect what you have to say? Um, and then adding to that, I have provided some of my own questions for clinicians. So um, how might disease prestige impact how I'm interpreting symptoms and listening to my patients' reporting of symptoms? Do I have a bias uh, against so-called soft diagnoses? Do I even think that soft diagnoses are a category and how is that impacting how I'm treating my patients? Um, is my patient on a diagnostic odyssey? And then seriously considering why are they on this odd diagnostic odyssey? Is it truly that we're not able to figure out what's going on or is it just because they're getting passed from doctor to doctor and having tests done and tests done with no kind of uh, end, in, end in sight? And then also, is it possible for my patient um, to be experiencing prejudice based on social traits and how might this have an impact on past care um, and how might it impact their present and future treatment? And do I, have my, do I have a suspicion that my patient may be misdiagnosed and uh, can clinically relevant information provide a more appropriate diagnosis? And so to conclude today, um, I have this final slide that kind of brings us full circle to the title of my talk, Patient Voices and Clinicians Concerns. There needs to be, I think, a striking a balance uh, between a patient's testimony and interpretations with a clinician's testimony and interpretation. So uh, the, the quote I like to use here is keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. So being aware that the, the solution is not to just um, go out and, and try to, you know, test a patient for every single um, possible thing that they may that they may assume that they have or you might assume that they have, but actually provide clinical evidence for why you why you were testing them for what you're testing them for. And also including, um, you know, not counting out these also soft diagnoses or these diseases that may have soft diagnoses as well. Uh, bring justice questions to the forefront. So is this patient being provided with the epistemic respect that they are owed or that they deserve? Is the patient telling me something that they know or am I just assuming that they don't know something based on social traits that they might have? And then also keeping uh, the best interest of the patient in, my, in mind. So am I acting within the best interest of the patient? So you could fill in the statement here. Blank is in the best interest of the patient because you can fill it in from your own clinical perspectives. Um, but that's all I've got for you today. Um, of course, the floor is open for questions. And then if you think of questions later on, I know I read this philosophers love to talk. So you, <laughs> you can send me an email and I'll be sure to write you back with uh, probably numerous paragraphs. But uh, thank you all. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Um, the CME attendance is working now. 
for those of you in person, we will put that slide up again right before we leave. Um, or if you tried it earlier, just try it again. For those of you online, I put that in the chat. So you should be able to see that. If not, please text FC, please email FCME at iuhealth.org and we can get that information to you. I'm gonna open it up to questions. If you have questions online, the Q&A box is open. Um, anybody in person wanna start us off? I say, I see the philosopher face over here. Thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Um, I think you did a good job of explaining, um, I mean, all the facets of how, why we need to be extra careful about epistemically respecting um, patients. How do we, um, I guess, balance the situations in which um, there are, you know, something is mentally afflicting a patient or there are cases where, you know, somebody may not be reporting something accurately because those cases do come up, even though you're right, they're vastly overreported. So how do um, clinicians, I guess, manage and balance that like that in some cases it is something mental or it is something is being misreported um, with the, the need to have epistemic justice? Right. I think, um, <clears throat> again, I think it's, it's keeping an open mind. So even if at one point you, you have diagnosed a patient maybe believing that their symptoms are psychological in nature or something of that sort. Um, I think also keeping an open mind that there may be another diagnosis that is present. Um, and for a lot of these diseases that I think are susceptible to epistemic injustice, I think inherently because of the testing that's required um, and the ruling out process that sometimes has to go on, um, it's a long time and it, it's, it's stressful for both patient and clinician to, to have to go through all of, all of these testing. And so I think it's just keeping an a mo open mind to the diagnostic and, and treatment process of just being aware of if I am providing the psychological diagnosis, um, also questioning yourself is, is something else going on um, that I'm not kind of, that I may not have been aware of the first time around. Um, in cases in, in the acute setting, um, that that may not work. So particularly with with women who are presenting to the ED with symptoms of heart attack that are not, you know, be, they're being treated for stress or something of that sort. Um, keeping an open mind may not help in that situation. So in, in that case, it may just be a fact of questioning yourself. Am, am I treating this correctly? Would I do this the same way if this were a man presenting these symptoms? Or am I treating this patient differently just because they are a woman? Um, so yeah, I think it's striking a balance and keeping an open mind through through that process. So if I understand you correctly, it's kind of about a, a sense of humility in that of like, I may not know, I need to be flexible, I need to be thorough, and I could be wrong through any of this. Right. Yes. Yeah. Good way of putting it. Thank you. Tom, that was absolutely outstanding. Um, I think it struck me that the two diseases that you focused on um, lupus and uh, I actually know it. Thank you, Ehlers Danlos. Um, are diseases that are complex to diagnose. And when you reference the um, diagnostic odyssey, <clears throat> I guess intuitively or inherently in that description to me means an active attempt over a prolonged period of time to make a diagnosis rather than a clear ignoring of or dismissive nature um, towards the patient. And I wondered if you could speak to um, what it might look like or how to maintain therapeutic alliance with a patient during what may necessarily be some level of an odyssey in the diagnosis of um, complex disease processes that are often a combination of um, uh, subjective and objective information um, that have to be put in context with one another. Right, yeah. Um, as far as the diagnostic odyssey go, I, I think a lot of these patients, um, they need they need clinician advocates. They need people to be on their side and to go with them through this odyssey. I think it's a diagnostic odyssey in the sense not for clinicians so much. I mean, I think it may be quite rare for a clinician to stay with a patient throughout their entire diagnosis odyssey. It's the diagnostic odyssey for the for the patient themselves, and the fact that they go through so many patient so many clinicians who tell them or dismiss their symptoms, or they go through this test and then the clinician kind of offboards them or, or just refers them to to the next to the next group. And so the diagnostic odyssey, I think 
Um, as far as maintaining that relationship, I think it really just is the persistence and perseverance to actually believe your patient and believe um, and to actually want to get to the bottom of what's going on and to have that kind of, um, I don't know, clinical persistence to want to stick with, with, with cases and with patients. I have one from online and then I think Jane has one as well. Are there ways that we as clinicians with higher social status than many of these patients can effectively advocate for these individuals to be heard when we are aware of such situations with other providers? So the inter-provider relationship is of course <laughs> fraught with its own. Um, that's why I focused only on uh, the patient and clinician side of things, but to kind of extend beyond uh, to how to address um, you know, conflicts that might be through providers where you, you're noticing a provider may not be providing you know, accurate or kind of that persistent care maybe to, to a patient. Um, I would say to follow the patient's journey closely. And if you feel strongly that this patient is being mistreated, um, you know, maybe have a, try to have a conversation with them, try to you know, maybe think about transferring their care to you um, to see you know, if you can provide perhaps what might be missing in this other clinical relationship. I mean, I'm not a clinician myself. I don't know how the, uh, <laughs> the, the conversations between uh, doctors go. Um, but I would just encourage to be an advocate for patients. And uh, if, you, if you truly believe that patients are on a diagnostic odyssey or are not getting the respect that they're owed, consider maybe taking patients within your own care as a possible solution. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to formulate this um, in a in an appropriate way. So it seems to me like the, um, and first of all, I loved this talk, this was really, fantastic. Um, but it seems to me like the conversation about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and a little bit lupus um, just perfectly mirrors the conversation we were having like 10 years ago about fibromyalgia. And so my question, I guess, would be, and it's a, clearly a comment in the form of a question, like, why have we not learned from that whole conversation and applied it moving forward? I mean, I would imagine that some of your literature pulls from the fibromyalgia um, experience. I don't know what we're calling it. Um, and now we're doing the, we're sort of really repeating past mistakes with Alos Danlos. It, it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> my third example before realizing that my topic, my, my talk was running long was actually fibromyalgia. Um, fibromyalgia, when they, there's a studies that they do on disease prestige, fibromyalgia is the lowest of like 33 diseases. Um, and so I mean, it is a, maybe a case of history repeating itself where um, there, there isn't, I mean, I think the fibromyalgia debate is, is still ongoing and it's still pretty recent in minds that this is kind of like all fitting together. Um, and I think we are now kind of approaching a time um, where particularly scholars that are like focusing on these experiences are bringing these to light and it's becoming more and more a part of the literature and clinicians are becoming more and more aware of it. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful for the future as far as, you know, the fact that we understand more about misdiagnosis and for fibromyalgia, HEDS, lupus and all of that, that's becoming more of a thing that clinicians talk about and are aware of, but I don't think we're there yet where we've come to solutions for those. It's still ongoing, I think. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tom Doyle, for presenting today. Um, we will be back in just two weeks, and that will be a completely virtual lecture in two weeks. And again, if you're interested in our conference, the registration deadline for that is next Friday. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>